Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maya Herring. I'm a specialist with the Design and Creative Placemaking Group at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm pleased to serve as your host today. I'm a cisgender Caucasian woman with light brown hair and bangs. I'm currently wearing a black and white speckled top and a black cardigan. And I'm currently sitting at my home office and there's a Frida Kahlo print behind me. Today is the fourth of four webinars to promote GSA's Art in Architecture program and upcoming artist commissions. During this session, we'll be highlighting commissioning opportunities in the Pacific Northwest. This webinar will be recorded and available for viewing online. If you'd like to view closed caption, please select the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. To kick us off today, we have a welcome message from NEA and GSA agency leaders. First up, you'll hear from the National Endowment for the Arts Chair, Maria Rosario Jackson, followed by General Services Administration Public Building Service Commissioner, Nina Albert. So we'll have the video for you in a few. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's Art in Architecture webinar. My name is Maria Rosario Jackson, and I serve as chair of the National Endowment for the Arts. To GSA Administrator Robin Carnahan, Public Building Service Commissioner Nina Albert, and the staff at GSA, thank you for what you do every day, and thank you for joining in today to share more details about the Art in Architecture program. We are honored to collaborate with the General Services Administration to increase awareness of and participation in the Art and Architecture program, which is now in its 50th year. This program has made a huge impact in communities across our country by supporting public art in federal buildings, showcasing the artistic talent and varied stories of our country, and helping us all share an understanding of our federal spaces. Commissioned art projects are a critical element of our civic and physical infrastructure. The process of public art making enhances communication between the federal government and local communities, enabling exchange on shared values and important themes. At the Arts Endowment, I'm committed to supporting our fellow federal agencies in advancing opportunities to integrate arts, culture, and design in our public buildings and structures. Public art helps reflect our democracy, aesthetically improve our built environment, and invites people to feel welcome and represented in shared spaces. The Arts Endowment is a grant maker, a convener, connector, catalyst, incubator, thought partner, and amplifier. We're proud to be a national resource that helps all Americans lead artful lives. And we're excited for artists to learn about opportunities such as the Art in Architecture program. Artists, your work is so important to our country. It reminds us of our humanity and connection to one another. It's essential to us reaching our full potential as a nation. You help us build the world we want to see. I encourage all aspiring and established artists to learn more about the program and consider joining the National Artist Registry. Imagine your work being featured in a federal building. Thanks for taking the time to attend this webinar. Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Nina Albert. I'm the Commissioner for the Public Building Service at the General Services Administration. I wanna thank our partners at the National Endowment for the Arts for hosting this event. GSA and the NEA have recently entered into a memorandum of understanding with the goal of promoting federal art commission opportunities to a broad and diverse cross-section of artists across the country. We want to reach artists like you and tell you about GSA's Art in Architecture program. GSA is the custodian of more than 500 large-scale, permanently installed public art pieces in federal buildings across the United States. These pieces are commissioned and cared for through GSA's Art and Architecture program. As we celebrate the 50-year history of the program, GSA has renewed our commitment to commissioning artists of our time for artwork in federal buildings. Art programs in federal buildings create a better environment for conducting government business. 
They offer a space to equitably represent the diversity of America and tell the story of the local community in which the federal building resides. Pieces in our collection inspire the people who visit our federal facilities to get services. You can see one of these pieces behind me now. It's Jacob Hashimoto's Kites, and it's here in GSA's headquarters in Washington, D.C. I also want to talk about GSA's plan to commission artwork at 26 land ports of entry along the northern and southern borders of the United States, which projects have been funded by the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. As the federal government's landlord, GSA builds all kinds of federal buildings, including land ports of entry, otherwise known as border stations. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law funded 26 projects in 11 states, and each of those projects will include public art. You're going to hear about the ones in your region today. We have worked to make the art and architecture program as easy and accessible for artists to join. We hope that after you participate in today's session, you'll join our National Artist Registry to be considered for upcoming commission opportunities. Thank you for being here. We look forward to your learning more about us, and we look forward to learning more about you. So our goal for today is to invite you to register for the National Artist Registry and to learn more about GSA's art and architecture program. We'll deliver a presentation followed by a Q&A session. You should feel free to enter questions into the Q&A box at any point during the presentation, and we'll address those towards the end of our session. Before we dive into details about the GSA's art and architecture program, I'd like to just share a brief overview about the NEA and relevant opportunities. The National Endowment for the Arts was established in 1965 as a federal agency that is the largest funder of the arts and arts education in communities nationwide and a catalyst of public and private support for the arts. With an annual budget of 180 million, that's from FY22, the NEA acts as a grant maker supporting projects across the country, a convener of arts and cultural field, researcher on the impact of arts and our nation. And lastly, NEA serves as a national resource on arts and culture and design to the federal family. On this slide, I'd like to share just a high level look at public funding for the arts in the country. At the federal level, NEA provides close to 3000 grants to arts and culture organizations annually supporting all artistic disciplines and a wide range of project types, from commissioning new works to funding design activities to supporting arts education initiatives. By law, the NEA distributes 40% of funding to regional arts organizations and state arts agencies who extend our reach across the country. These regional and state entities have a range of funding opportunities with many offering individual artist awards and commissions. Six regional arts organizations, each representing a geographic membership of states, assist the NEA in distributing funds and programs nationally through touring and other activities that are responsive to the needs of those specific regions. Through partnerships with 50 state arts agencies and six US jurisdictions, both federal funds and funds from state government address priorities identified at the state level and provide grants for artists, arts education, organizations, and communities. And finally, at the local level, local arts agencies, including arts councils and commissions or city or county departments are funded by municipal governments in small and large communities all across the country. These agencies are in your local community and often commission and issue calls for public art and are likely most knowledgeable about local opportunities in your backyard. The NEA funds 501c3 nonprofit organizations, units of government, and federally recognized tribes directly through our grant making programs. That include Challenge America, our Grants for Arts projects, Our Town, and re research grants. There are deadlines throughout the year for these different opportunities. A couple of examples. So um, in our Grants for Arts project category, a grant to the University of Texas at Austin supported artist fees and a public art installation by Sarah Oppenheimer. 
Artists created a pair of 15 foot high architectural glass panels for permanent installation at the university's Cockrell School of Engineering. In New York City, an award to the Madison Square Park Conservancy in 2020 supported the public art installation Ghost Forest by Maya Lin at Madison Square Park. I'd encourage you to take a look to organizations in your community that are eligible to apply to the NEA and collaborate on a grant application to support the commissioning of your work. At the same time, uh, we encourage you to get to know your regional arts organizations and various funding opportunities that they may offer. The NEA distributed $9.9 .9 million to regional arts organizations in 2021. For example, the New England Foundation for the Arts, which is a regional arts organization, has a public art funding program that supports individual artists. Your local state arts agencies can also be a tremendous resource for programming and funding. $48.8 million went out to state arts agencies from the NEA in 2021. To distribute across the country, each state has a slightly different offering from individual artists awards to a wide range of other funding opportunities. And lastly, while we don't have a comprehensive list of local arts agencies on file to share with you, I'd still encourage you to connect with your local arts agency right in your backyard. In addition to providing grants, many local arts agencies provide services to artists and arts organizations and present public programming that you could be a part of. There are many extraordinary resources out there for public artists. Um, we don't have enough time to cover a full comprehensive list, but I'll share a few places to look for commissioning opportunities, including the Public Art Network hosted by Americans for the Arts, Forecasts Artist Opportunities Database. Uh, for those seeking tools or inspiration, you, here are a few that might pique your interest, including West Staff, which is a regional arts organization, Public Art Archive, Springboard for the Arts, Artists Working in Community Handbook, a fabulous website that profiles artists in residence models with municipal government. Um, there's also Bloomberg's Asphalt Art Guide for creating art on roadways and public spaces, and Monument Lab, which is a nonprofit organization that works on participatory approaches to public engagement and collective memory. And lastly, I'd like to encourage you to stay in touch with the NEA through our website and social media. Thank you for your time. Uh, before I turn the presentation over to GSA, we'd love to get a sense of the audience. So we have a short poll. If you could take a few minutes to just complete this just two question poll and then we'll share out the responses. Great, so it looks like we have some individual artists. We also have some of our federal partners and um, a public art administrator. And it looks like some of you have had, um, as individual artists have completed a public art commission and, and some have not. So thanks very much for participating in the poll. Thank you, Maya. Thank you to the NEA for joining us in this effort to promote opportunities for um, artists across the country and to talk about both our commissions and the National Artist Registry. I'm Jennifer Gibson. I'm the director of the Center for Fine Arts, which is in the public building service at the General Services Administration. And with me today is Nicole Avila, who will be talking to you about the registry and the land port of entry projects. But first I'll give you an overview of art and architecture, which is 50 years old. We're in October, we're gonna start a year long celebration of our 50th anniversary. And during that time, we've commissioned over 500 artworks and spent have spent a little over $50 million. The um, program is part of, as I said, GSA. And GSA is the real estate agency for the government. Um, we, one part of GSA deals with supplies and all of the IT issues, and the public building service is responsible for constructing, modernizing, and maintaining federal buildings throughout the continental U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and 
Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. Um, the program is, um, we're in the office of the chief architect. So we're embedded in the whole construction process. And um, one thing as we're looking today to keep in mind is the art and architecture program does not have a official style. We do not say that the government is only going to commission certain kinds of artwork. Rather, we're looking for the best artists in the country to create works for the American public. It's also quite distinct from all of NEA's programs because we are not a grant program. We actually hire an artist who's then placed under contract to create a, a new original artwork for a specific building. And um, so artists who work with us are basically signing up for a five to 10 year set of activities from the point where they are, begin to work on the project until the work is finally installed. The, as I said, we're starting our 50th anniversary and our initial work that was commissioned and installed is Alexander Calder's Flamingo. And something that you will see on all of the information that we send out, certainly a iconic monument also in the city of Chicago. It's located at the Chicago Federal Center, a set of Mies van der Rohe buildings. When the work was installed, it was a cause for a great celebration. There was a parade, there were public events, Calder, who you see on the screen attended, and um, it was the occasion for great joy that the government was launching this program. And we have continued uh, since then uh, to commission works whenever we're constructing new buildings, doing a major modernization. The, um, we're in the Center of Fine Arts, which includes not only art and architecture, but GSA's Fine Arts Collection. And that collection includes works from the 1850s to the present. And in fact, we have, last week we installed a work by Nick Cave in a federal building in Detroit. There's an installation starting this week in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. A Monique von Genderen is doing a mural in the new courthouse being constructed there. When those, those commissioned works then become part of the fine arts collection. Uh, in our central office, which is in Washington, DC, we have seven staff members, which include me, as well as three art and architecture uh, project managers and three uh, staff uh, devoted to collections management. We also have regional fine arts officers. GSA um, is divided into 11 regions across the country, and each has a person who's responsible for art within their region and who participates in the art and architecture project when we're doing a project in their region. The money for all of these projects actually comes from congressionally authorized um, budgets for federal buildings. So when Congress authorizes that GSA construct a new courthouse or a new land port of entry, we receive one half of 1% of the estimated construction costs. So it's not the full budget. It doesn't include land or design fees. It's just the construction budget. We have half a percent of that um, to commission an artwork. And the art budgets generally range from 100,000 to a million dollars, but that's, those are the averages. We sometimes are above, sometimes below. And as you see, it's a penny on every $2. In a normal year, we initiate about five projects. And indeed, for the coming fiscal year, which starts October 1, we have four new courthouse projects coming as well as a federal building project. Um, and we are commission works for a variety of building types, federal buildings, uh, agency headquarters, courthouses, and the strong reason for us to be having these webinars is we also have a large influx of funding from the bipartisan infrastructure law to commission artworks for land ports of entry. And this is, there's funding for 26 uh, projects 
Some totally new construction, some will be modernization. The, along the southern border, there are six projects. We have one of those projects, Calexico West, had already started when the uh, Congress passed the uh, BIL. But uh, so we had an artist already under contract, but we will be selecting artists for the other projects. And along the northern border, we have 20 projects. 12 of them are in upstate New York and New England, and then the remainder across the northern border in the Northwest and in Canada. The budgets there for these for the Northwest border projects will range from $250,000 to $900,000. And Nicole will talk more about those projects in a few moments. To show you the kinds of work we're commissioning, we're just gonna look at these different building types, including federal agency headquarters. Obviously, the bulk of those are based in Washington, DC. Here, an example, the US Coast Guard headquarters, um, which is in, in the Anacostia neighborhood of Washington. It's a new construction on a historic site. And uh, for that, we commissioned three artworks, Mark Suvaro's, thanks from the saved ones. In the main lobby, we have a work by Teresita Fernandez. And then in the conference area of the building, a series of uh, photographs by Anne Millet. And as I show you these, keep in mind that anything we commission is intended to be on public display. It is, once we commission them, they are permanently installed and we maintain the work thereafter. It also is in the parts of the building where a visitor would be able to see the work. So we're not putting art in hallways or offices, hallways here at Conference Center, but you know, private hallways, conference rooms, offices, Anybody who would visit the building would be able to see the artwork. We select the artwork. It's a, basically it's a federal acquisition process, but to help guide GSA, we have a panel that's formed for each project. And it is, it, the people on it are knowledgeable about the project, the uh, agency that's going to be involved in it and the area where we're working. So the lead designer is part of this. We have art peers. These, this is a group of arts professionals from around the country who we invite to participate because of their knowledge of contemporary art. And um, then we have an arts professional from the area where we're doing the project. And so this may be a person associated with a local museum, an arts organization, or an arts council, a uh, college or university in the area, but somebody who's aware of art and aware of the artists who are working in a community. We also have a community representative and then the federal client representative, or we will call them the tenant. This is the agency that's going to be occupying the building. And this group gets together to talk about what kind of art would be appropriate. As I had mentioned, we commission work for federal buildings and several examples include Martin Purrier's Bearing Witness, which is in the federal triangle in Washington and uh, surrounded by 30s neoclassical buildings as, and then the last building that was uh, built within the federal triangle. The, uh, in Houston at the Mickey Leland Federal Building, we uh, were dealing with a modernization. And these modernizations sometimes are buildings stripped down to their structure, um, but um, we are able to use the funding in this case to actually commission two artworks in the main lobby Mary Temple's Winter Light, and uh, Leonardo Drew's number one, two, three. We have some projects that are on campuses, and uh, here at the Denver Federal Center, which is the out just in Lakewood, Colorado, just outside of Denver. It is a federal compound that's largely was from the Second World War. We have it's 623 acres. We have 48 buildings and 
let's see, 28 federal agencies there. And a lot of these buildings are undergoing modernization. So uh, on, when we had several projects going, construction projects going simultaneously, we pulled the funds and commissioned Andrea Zatel to create this series of pavilions, which she proposed, that are on the campus that anybody on the campus can go and use. They, I think they're actually Wi-Fi accessible, so people could work there. And um, we currently have two additional projects on the Denver Federal Center underway. And in the next few weeks, we'll be starting another project for which artists um, will be considered. So if you're thinking about joining the artist registry, it's a good time to do it. In Puerto Rico, we've uh, recently installed our and our studios building blocks in front of the, a new FBI facility. And obviously we're dealing with high security and this is on a secure federal compound, but the works are highly visible. And that was largely at the direction of the panel, particularly the client representatives and the community and local arts representatives who wanted a work that would be visible to people either entering the campus or actually from outside of its perimeter. And um, the artists hearkened back to the bright colors of old uh, San Juan. And it's a work, certainly Puerto Rico is in the news once again, unfortunately, because of the hurricane. And because so much of our work is outdoors, we do a lot of uh, work with the artists and conservators and engineers to ensure that it will withstand conditions. In this case, we had to, we worked with the artists to ensure that the sculptures would be able to withstand hurricane force winds because our goal is to have the work remain standing and um, our being able to then care for it. Uh, a recent installation in Philadelphia at the Green Federal Building, Mo Brooker's The Fruit of the Spirit, a uh, oil on canvas. And there you see Mr. Brooker. Unfortunately, between the time it was installed and the uh, dedication in February, uh, Mr. Brooker died. This is the administrator of GSA at the celebration of the artwork. And Mr. Brooker's family was able to attend and speak at that event. And we, in this case, it's interesting. Brooker was a local artist, old time Philadelphia artist. This was the largest commission he had done. Um, but the panel, and we do not have a preference for local artists. However, we make sure that local artists are included in the artists who are reviewed. And in this case, I think we had great success in um, having a work that's a wonderful addition to Philadelphia and to the federal collection. The panel, as I said, has the seven members and they meet at least three times. One, to have a general introduction to the program. They would hear you know, how it operates, what the expectations are from different panel members. They'll be briefed on the activities of the tenant agency, whether it's how the FBI uses a building, how CBP, Customs and Border Protection, uh, operates a land port of entry, or a land port of entry is a border station, and how courts function in a building. And then um, the people in the community also have the opportunity to talk about what's important to the community. They discuss ways art might be incorporated and then um, have the opportunity to nominate artists or suggest that we contact artists to join the slide registry. A pool of candidates is then presented at a second meeting, which is held approximately six months later. And it's an all day review of all the artist candidates and the panel members are voting and they're not voting, they are expressing their preferences. We cannot ask for a consensus or agreement. We're interested in hearing what each member has to say. And then all of that information is compiled as we put together a, the procurement documents to support the artist selection of a specific artist. After the artist is under contract, which is a period of time later, there are many meetings um, between GSA, the design team, the project team, the tenant agency, and the artist. But the artist develops a concept. The artist 
in being reviewed does no work. Our, the work all occurs after an artist is under contract. And that the artist then presents their concept to the panel. And the panel has the opportunity to ask questions and then make a recommendation on whether we should proceed with the project or not. One of the uh, major group of buildings that we have been doing commissions for are US courthouses. And um, the, as I had said, we have no official style. We have no official material or medium that we encourage artists to respond to the site and the client and the design of the building. Um, there is similarly no official architectural style. Here at the Moakley Courthouse in Boston, uh, we have the courthouse on the harbor and inside we have Ellsworth Kelly was the artist selected and he created a series of 21 panels that are in this rotunda. And then at either end of the arcing, arching walkways that face out to the harbor. And the courtrooms are off of these uh, walkways. In St. Louis, the, at the Eagleton Courthouse, and these two examples are large scale buildings. Um, some of our court, these each have, I can't remember the number of courtrooms, but I think there were 20 some in the Eagleton Courthouse. Um, which means many judges, lots of facilities, it's a large building. We have other courthouses that might be a single courtroom. And so are much smaller in scale. Uh, in this one, the property, the block across the street was actually the construction staging site. And um, as the construction and the building was completed, we were looking at that site, figuring out what to do and actually commissioned an artist to do something with that block in downtown St. Louis. Valerie Jodin, a painter, was actually the artist who was selected. And here you see an example of her, one of her paintings and then a very similar kind of vocabulary as she developed this plan for the park. And her work, we define the art, we always define an artwork because we, these artworks are protected under the Visual Artists' Rights Act. And so hers is designed basically sidewalk to sidewalk. It's everything that you see there, including the plantings. We know how to take care of it in the future, how to replace plants with what, at what size. Uh, she even designed the benches that are in the park. And then in Tuscaloosa, a, a building of a very different style and smaller than the previous two, uh, we have a series of murals by Caleb O'Connor that are on the history of Tuscaloosa and that area of Alabama. So that the types of work that are installed and that are commissioned vary greatly because the goal is to meet the desires and needs of that community and the tenant agency, as well as to uphold a standard of uh, commissioning significant artwork for the government. Another example of recent courthouse in Los Angeles. And in this instance, the panel was very interested in ensuring that artists from the Los Angeles area would be in the pool of candidates. And which we always take into account. But in this case, it was interesting. Three artists received commissions and the number of artists varies sometimes depending on the budget, a larger budget project. We may determine that it's in our, everybody's interest to have several um, commissions. In this case, two of the three artists, Mary Course and Catherine Oakby were both from Los Angeles. And when we're commissioning art, we're really looking to have it integrated into the building. The artist works with the design team, works closely with the architect in figuring out how the building can, the artwork can be incorporated. And then we're looking at structurally how to include it, how to light it and so on. Catherine Opie used the actual atrium of the building to create this work on Yosemite Falls, where from the top floor, you see the top of the falls and going down each floor, the, um, 
you go down the falls until you reach a point where the falls hit the water and then the remainder of the images are the reflection in the water. And the last project that I will show you is the courthouse in Nashville, Tennessee, um, just recently completed and dedicated, I think just this past month or two. And um, the artwork is in the entry lobby, Allison Shots, the Robe of, of Justitia, and it is a mosaic. The panel was interested in work that had some classical reference without actually being illustrative of classicism. And um, Alison Schatz was thinking about the robes on classical figures and certainly on the figure of justice and realized that that form in mosaic on the ceiling of the entryway. Now, I had said that these are, commissioning an artist is basically a procurement art. Uh, activity. We have to be able to justify why we are spending federal funds on a particular, for a particular artist to create an artwork. Um, we, during those meetings, everything that the panel is discussing and what they feel is important is incorporated into a series of minutes. And we ask them to address specific evaluation criteria, including what media might be appropriate, what materials would be um, good for the site, uh, content or subject matter, and the style. And as you see, different sites really have very different um, outcomes as far as the type of work that's um, commissioned. The panel creates a short list of artists for GSA then to contact. And um, the art and architecture staff person will ask each of the finalists for information on their prior work so that we have examples of projects they have completed and for references who to be contacted to see how was it working with the artists? Were they able to complete the project as designed on time and on budget? So today we want to feature focus on the land ports of entry. Nicole Avila, who will be speaking, will give you an overview of a number of the ports and be able to tell you about how to join the artist registry. She also is one of those people who's in the meetings and uh, totally aware of the kinds of things that panels ask about and what artists are concerned about so can provide other insights. And with that, Nicole. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you to everyone at the NEA and to all of you for joining today. As Jennifer said, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the different types of artwork that we've commissioned for land ports of entry, um, mostly in the last 20 years. Um, as you can imagine, just like the federal courthouses and the federal office buildings, um, they vary in size that the buildings do. So we sometimes have land ports of entry or border stations that are relatively small in scale, and therefore the artwork is tends to be smaller in scale as well. We also have much larger ports where we have multiple art commissions. So hopefully I'll be able to show you the diversity of art that we've commissioned for our border stations. Um, the first one that I'm going to show you is Patricia Layton and Delgais Passage in Montana. Now this border station is relatively small in terms of the building, but since it's in a rural part of Mo Montana, the site is relatively large and that allowed the artist to create a land-based artwork that includes earthworks and glacial boulders as you um, drive north or south. And it's a reference to the changing topography of that part of Montana, referencing the mountains, the fact that it used to be the bottom of an ocean, uh, and of course, glacial change. The next artwork is also on the northern border in Messina, New York. Um, for this land port of entry, um, it's an interesting site because in order to get into Canada, you have to cross by Akwesasne Mohawk territory. So for this project, the artist selected is um, a member of the Mohawk community himself. And for the artwork, he created um, something that references both the European heritage of New York, but also the Iroquois heritage. Um, he used the structure of the wampum belt, which is used by the Iroquois. Um, as a means of trade. 
Um, but he also is referring to the historical um, tradition of panoramas. And this is an example of a panorama along the Hudson River in New York. So for this project, he um, took a boat up and down the St. Lawrence River, photographing each bank of the river. And together created a photo mural on glass that um, speaks to the, the landscape of the surrounding area, but also the um, complex um, cultural histories. The project that's closer to all of you in the Pacific Northwest is Lead Pencil Studios Non Sign 2 in Blaine, Washington, at the Peace Arch Land Port of Entry. Um, for this project, the artists were interested in um, using the language of billboards to sort of draw attention to the beauty of the landscape. And so what you see here, and then perhaps some of you have seen it in person, is a, um, a sculpture that looks like a billboard with no advertisement in the center. So instead of an advertisement, it frames the beautiful um, landscape. Constructed all of, the, of all these stainless steel rods. Another project on the northern border is in War Road, Minnesota. Helen Mira created a two part artwork. The first part is this piece inside, and it shows a spectrum of all of the native birds of the area. And it's arranged um, in rainbow order of birds that have um, colors in their names. So zooming in, you can see gray catbird. Gray Jay, Scarlet Tanger, um, and it's arranged sort of in a tree line format. Artwork outside also references color and perception. She's installed five different panels of different colors that, as you can imagine, with the changing seasons, appear and disappear um, as you drive by. So sometimes the blue sticks, or sometimes the green sticks out, sometimes the white sticks out. Um, it just changes with the seasons and draws attention to um, the changing landscape. Another artwork is Nina Cachadorian's Grand State of Maine in, um, in Maine, in Van Buren, Maine. And for this sculpture, she uses the you know, very traditional language of bronze sculpture to speak about all of the official symbols of the state of Maine from the moose as the state mammal, the uh, whoopie pie as the state treat and everything in between. I'm going to show you a series of artworks that were commissioned for the San Ysidro Land Port of Entry. This is an example of a very large scale port that in terms of timeline, um, I think spanned over 10 years. Um, and we commissioned five artists for this project. This is the largest land port of entry in the United States. It's between San Diego and Tijuana and um, is very large scale, as I said. This is Mi Jin Yoon's Double Horizon. Um, for this project, she created an LED um, artwork that spans the entire um, swath of the canopy above where the cars drive. And actually the LED computer systems ties in with the um, gates that the cars drive under. So every time a car drives under a gate, a ripple of light appears in the LED artwork. And as you can imagine, you can see there's a whole procession of cars here. I think it's about 23, 26 lanes of traffic. There are cars passing through at all times. And so the ripples of light bounce into each other and combine um, to create the, the show. Another artwork is Nori Sato's of a leaf or a feather above the pedestrian walkway as you walk towards Mexico. Ryan McGinnis's datum is cited at the center of the port where it's um, on the parking structure. Um, it's a very large parking structure in the middle of the port um, and it's visible from many areas of, of the site. Um, the content of his work is drawn from the culture, the history, the landscape of the, this region of the border. And in order to create this, um, Ryan, um, uses a process where he takes an image and he distills it down to its very basic formal ele elements. It's a series of sketching and sketching and sketching until he distills the, the object or the image down to its very basic form. Here you see 25 of those icons, which he calls them, and the other 25. 
so there are 50 in all that are repeated across the um, parking structure as a modern freeze, sort of like a modern version of the classical. Also for the San Ysidro Lane Port of Entry is Marcos Ramirez is about time, sited outside of a pedestrian building. It's scaled more to the pedestrians because that's who will be seeing the artwork and it um, remarks on time and also inscribed into um, each of the cones is we are all equal, somos todos distintos, um, saying that there is equality and diversity. The last piece in San Isidro is Ruben Ochoa's Mis Marcadores. Uh, Ruben grew up in Oceanside, not far from San Diego, and he spent um, his childhood crossing the border, visiting family in Mexico. And so he really wanted to create an artwork that spoke to all ages, not just adults, but children as well, and the memories of, of enjoying um, cookies that are called conchas. They're shell-shaped cookies that are sweet cookies that are enjoyed at this part of the border. Um, and what you see it as the artwork are actually enlarged cookie cutters called marcadores um, that are used to create the conchas. And the colors um, refer to the three most popular um, flavors of the cookie, so vanilla, strawberry, and chocolate. Back on the northern border, there's Elizabeth Billings and Andrea Wasserman's um, commission for the Derby Line Land Port of Entry in Vermont. And this is an example, again, of a two-part artwork, but also artwork that's very integrated. Um, the outdoor portion includes four cast -free concrete walls that are part of the building. And then on the inside, they created two wood installations in each of the buildings above the big desk that people in the workspace. Last artwork I'm going to show you is our most recently installed um, artwork at a land port of entry. Um, this is for the Alexandria Bay land port of entry and um, it was designed by Morphosis Architects. The artist commission was Anne Hamilton and she created a sprawling textile um, to go inside the main port building. It um, kind of winds around the worker area where all the, their desks are, but also the main um, lobby where um, People will walk in the building to, to speak with CBP and Conservation Border Protection. What's interesting about this artwork is that um, she wanted to involve the community that uses the port, both in terms of the local community that lives near the port, but also the Customs and Border Protection offices. And so in order, in order to create this textile, she accepted donations of clothing from many of the CBP officers who work in the building and also the local community used the textiles to weave together a design that references the horizon line, um, but also um, waves because in order to go into Canada or come into the United States at this border station, you have to cross over the St. Lawrence River. So that is it for the land port of entry projects that we've commissioned to date. Um, in order to get you all included, um, I'm going to next go over how you can submit your portfolio to the National Artist Registry. So first you need to go to our website, which is www.gsa.gov front slash art and architecture. And I believe we'll be putting that in the chat. You can also just go GSA Art and Architecture. So once you go to our website, you'll see a very brief overview of our process. Um, then it'll take you to, if you keep scrolling down, who is eligible. In order to be con considered for GSA commissions, you have to either be a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident, a lawful permanent resident of the United States. Before you join the registry, um, we need you to gather all your materials. And as you're gathering your portfolio materials, um, it's very important to understand that the most important materials that you'll, you'll be submitting are your images. Um, you can submit up to 20 images of work created in the last 10 years. And it's important that these images are show good representation of your overall body of work. Because since we select artists based on their past work, we need to be able to see your images, see what the images represent in terms of the individual artworks, but also your overall body of work, because that is 
how we will think, okay, well, we see that this artist created this for this project, how might their work be incorporated into the project that we're selecting artists for today? So in addition to your images, um, you'll also need to include an image list that basically provides information on each image and a current resume. And so you can submit your registry materials in one of two ways. You can either submit an online form and then email your portfolio materials to nationalartistregistry.com nationalartistregistry at gsa.gov, or you can complete, you can download a PDF, save it, and then email the PDF with all of your other portfolio materials to nationalartistregistry at gsa.gov. I'm going to walk you through how to submit the online form. We've made this as simple as possible. Um, it's a very short form. You just um, include your basic contact information, make sure to click that you're a US citizen, or a permanent resident. The second page is optional demographic information. Um, you can answer all of these questions. Some of them are none. Um, answering these questions are not, do not affect your eligibility for projects. We are collecting this information just so that we get a picture of um, the group of artists who are interested in our projects. But it's your choice. So once you click submit, you will get a confirmation page that says that you've completed your form. Now you're not finished submitting to the registry. You still need to um, email your materials, your 20 images, the image list, and your resume to National Artist Registry at gsa.gov. Okay, so then if your images are too large to email, that's okay. Um, you can upload your files on the Google Drive and then share the files with National Artist Registry at gsa.gov. If you have any questions, you can contact us for help. Um, the quickest way to get in touch with us is to email us at nationalartistregistry at gsa.gov. Now, what happens next? You've submitted all your information. When will you hear from us? How will you hear from us? Um, we will confirm receipt of your portfolio materials. An actual person, someone on our staff, will review your email, review your submissions, and make sure that everything's accounted for. Um, if everything's accounted for, you'll get a confirmation saying, yes, we have everything, you're not on our registry, and you'll be considered for projects for the next 10 years. Um, if your submission is incomplete, that person will let you know that as well um, and let you know what you need to submit um, so your portfolio is complete. Um, Understand that it's an actual person reviewing your submission, so it's not going to be an immediate response. It might take a couple of days, it might take a couple of weeks, but someone will get in touch with you. Um, once you're in the registry, we will not be contacting you every time you're reviewed by a panel, but if you are shortlisted, we will contact you because we will need you to submit some more information so that we can further evaluate you for the project. You'll need to send contact information for three references. You'll need to send budgets for three to five projects you've completed in the last 10 years, and you'll need to submit a very brief statement on your general approach to work. Now, since we select artists based on their past work, this is not a proposal for what you would do for this project. It is just a brief statement, a general statement on your approach to projects. Okay, so I will bring you all back to the map of all the projects, the five projects in the Pacific Northwest. Um, the project budgets range, as Jennifer said, from $250,000 to $900,000, and they are um, in Washington, there are three in Washington, one in Idaho, and one in Alaska. Um, I will let you know that we are not starting the artist selection process for these five projects um, this year, um, but I still encourage you to submit your portfolio materials because they are all, there are plenty of projects all around the country that we are starting. Um, this year and early next year. So um, just in terms of timelines for projects, projects, if a project is, is quicker, it'll be five years that you're working on the project, but it's not unusual for projects to take much longer than that um, because we follow the overall design and construction um, schedule for a project. So five is kind of the shorter end of the timeline. I think with that, I will put up our program website and our email address. And if you have any questions, um, I'll hand it over to Maya. 
Hi, everyone. We do have a couple of questions. Um, so first one, is there a commitment to hiring underserved populations uh, for this program? There, our commitment is to ensure that any artist and include and certainly underserved artists are able to compete for the projects. And so that's why we're encouraging people to join the artist registry and just start on this process. We are in with these land ports of entry. And I want to emphasize once you join the registry, you can be considered for a project anywhere in the country. So you may live in Iowa where we're not, we are not doing any federal projects at the moment. No, we actually are at Des Moines, uh, but uh, we already have an art and, and Hamilton's actually doing a project there, but we might not be doing a project in your area. That doesn't preclude your being considered for a project anywhere. And it's particularly important with these land ports of entry because the budgets are varying so greatly. So if you're an artist who has less experience, you haven't done $400,000 commissions in the past, but you've done smaller projects, some of these smaller land ports of entry are a great opportunity um, because the budgets will be more comparable to what we can um, award. Because as I said, it is a procurement process by which we have to be able to explain why an artist is selected and uh, our expectation that they can successfully complete a project. Wonderful, thank you, Jennifer. Another question is, are artist teams eligible or is it just individual artists in this part of the process? Nicole? I can answer that. Um, yes, artist teams are encouraged to apply as well. Um, we have several commissions with artists who've worked um, in teams of two or larger. So um, yes, the answer is yes, teams are encouraged. And, and we showed examples, the FBI building in San Juan were two mm -hmm. artists and the Derby Line Land Port of Entry, which uh, Nicole just showed also a team of two artists. So there could be you, more. It doesn't have to just be two, but it could be a larger group. Would you recommend then if an individual artist was interested that they submit as themselves? And then also if they were interested, submit as part of a team um, as well? Nicole? Yeah, if an artist works individually, but also as part of a team, they can submit in both ways. Um, with the example of the Puerto Rico artists, Behar and or R and R Studios, um, they submitted as a team, just as a team. But in the example of the Derby Line project, it was with Billings and Andrea Wasserman. They both individually they submitted as individual artists, but then when one was recommended as a a finalist for a project and then ultimately got selected she said I want to work with my you know colleague who's also in the registry um, and then they decided to work together so it it really varies I mean if, if you're an artist and you work individually but also as a team then you can submit in both ways um, another question how uh, when should I expect to hear back from GSA about a project if I submit to the registry? Well, I can answer that. So um, if you submit to the registry, you'll get a confirmation from one of our staff members that you've submitted. Um, if you're reviewed by a panel, but not shortlisted, you're not going to hear because there's nothing that we need you to do at that time. If you are shortlisted, we will reach out to you. It's sort of a numbers game because we have you know, over a thousand artists in the registry. And usually in, in an average year, we have about five projects. This year or the next couple of years, we have more because of the bipartisan infrastructure law. So it ups the, the likelihood, but every artist who submits to the registry is not going to get a commission is the reality. Well, thank you and, so and I think that we're tied to capital construction. So in contrast to a, um, a program that might be so purchasing a group of artworks for a building, we're not doing that. We're, we are commissioning permanently installed, generally larger scale artwork uh, for these new federal and buildings and modernizations. 
Um, so we do have one last poll as we close out this session, but I do want to thank Jennifer and Nicole so much for the comprehensive and inspiring overview of GSA's art and architecture program. Thank you all for joining us here today. It was a lot of fun to view such um, extraordinary commissions from GSA art and architecture program. And we're thrilled to see public art come um, together in the coming years. So thanks everyone and goodbye for today.